If you stand with me once more as we share uh, the word of God and as we continue to, on this theme, re rehearing um, the teachings of Jesus, the words of Jesus as we can hear them for so long and they lose some of their impact of being life transforming words. So Luke chapter 2 verses 4 to 1 through 52. Luke chapter 2 verses 4 to 1 through 52. And it reads, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found, <laughs> somebody said that long, <laughs> amen. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house, or some translations say about my father's business? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. God, we thank you and we bless you. Breathe on us. Speak to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. On this Sunday, as we start this voyage of looking at the teachings of Jesus as it was introduced uh, last week, and also as we celebrate the life of our modern day prophet, Dr. King, I want to talk about service beyond self. Right. Service beyond self. As my mama used to say at times, so-and-so don't want to help nobody but themselves. <laughs> Service beyond self. The first four books of the New Testament, which are... Aren't you glad you sat by somebody who could say that this morning? <laughs> you know, as a preacher, people often talk to me. And they said, you know, just like it says in Jeremiah 6 and 9, right? I said, well, I don't know what Jeremiah 6 and 9 says. I ain't no walking in Sacramento when it comes to biblical references. Tell me what it's saying. I'll let you know what I feel about it. <laughs> but you probably shouldn't know the first four books of the Bible. The first four books of the New Testament in particular, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are written in the form of ancient biographies. Each one is in its own way has been crafted by an author to depict and describe through example and word an image of Jesus. Though a lot of the same information is shared at various points, each writer has a purpose in mind. However, given the various purposes, neither author tries to tell every event that happened every day in the life of Jesus. Traditional libraries could not contain it, and digital libraries would be ever expanding. So many of the events that happen in the life of Jesus are not listed. And some events listed by one gospel writer is not listed by others. Such is the case of our text. Luke mentions the childhood event that happened when Jesus was 12 years of age. Now, though we do not have a lot of information in the Bible that speaks of the childhood of Jesus, 
there are non-canonical uh, sources that did not make the scriptures that talk about Jesus growing up as a boy. And though I will not cover them here, I do remember having to read some of those sources while in seminary. But can you imagine what it must have been like to be growing up as a comrade, a childhood friend, a younger sibling, a cousin of Jesus? Not as the Savior, but as a child. I have to think, did he walk on water? As a child? Mm. Did he like making his bed? Did he like eating his figs? Not broccoli. <laughs> Was Jesus a child that went around quoting the Psalms all day? Or did he throw spitballs and have water fights? Or throw childlike fits? Can you hear his mother saying, Stop acting up, Jesus? You were conceived of the Holy Ghost. You ain't acting like the Holy Ghost. You acting like Joseph. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I know when I was growing up as a young preacher, 16 in high school, that was one line I heard almost every week, if not every day. And the line was, and you call yourself a preacher. Somebody in here has heard that you call yourself a deacon. You call yourself a praise. You call, no, I didn't call myself nothing. As a matter of fact, if I had, I wouldn't have called myself to be a preacher. It's God who called me to preach preacher. But can't you hear one of his colleagues saying, hmm, talking about he's a savior? What he going to say? Inquiring minds would want to know what was Jesus like as a child? Thanks to the Gospel of Luke, we do have this event that happened in the life of Jesus when he was 12 years of age. You see, during the time of Jesus, practicing faith was not an add-on. If you've ever been to Jerusalem or go to Jerusalem, you would observe that religion for them is not an add-on. It's a lifestyle. So their customs, their traditions are part of their faith, and it was part of the faith is what this text is talking about, that at several times, three in particular, where all of the Jews, males 12 years and older, all of the adults had to go to Jerusalem. And this particular time, they're in Jerusalem for a celebration. It was the f festival of the Passover. Right. Passover marked that event in which the people remembered and celebrated how God had delivered them from Egypt. And what a blessing it is sometimes to look back and just recall all God has done. Oh, bless his holy name. Bless his, bless, bless his holy name. They celebrate the Passover, all of those moments that were significant to them that realized how God brought them out of Egypt. And while bringing them out of Egypt, anywhere the blood had been put over the doorposts, the death angel passed over. Oh, don't make me shout. Because there are some moments when I celebrate God for all God has done in my life. But there are other moments when I celebrate the stuff that could have killed me, but it passed over. It could have taken me out, but it passed over. In the wrong place at the wrong time, but it passed over. They were celebrating the Passover. So because they would celebrate the Passover, they wouldn't stop year after year after year. They would go to celebrate the Passover. And when we come to this text, they're in town for the big celebration. And once the event was over, the people returned home. Now we must remember that these were large caravans. They did not travel as mother, father, two kids, and a dog in the car. They did not travel with everyone in the same wagon. There were sections of people. They felt, they felt, not me, they felt because the women walked at a slower pace, the women would always leave first. Then the men would come up. 
and the children just would interact anywhere they needed to go. So when people ask, how could they have left the child? I really do. I really do. You may write me an email, but I really feel sorry for Joseph in this text. It ain't stated, but I feel sorry for him. Because I'm sure Mary thought Jesus was Joseph. And Joseph thought he was with Mary. The reason I feel sorry, because I recognize, brother, y'all got to help me. That Mary probably walked back and said, why didn't you get him? You are the man. Why didn't you get him? Why did you didn't handle your business? Why you didn't take care of your situation? But every man in this room knows if he opens his mouth, it's World War I, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all in one. I saw, an, I, saw, I saw an older guy who had been married like six or seven times some years the other day. He, he asked him, he said, how to, how to maintain it? He said, well, you got, to, you got to discover if you want to be, be correct or you want to be happy because you ain't going to be both at the same time. Yeah. So one could very well see how Jesus could be lost in the crowd because they're not traveling together. And one thinks he's here. The other one thinks he's over there. As a matter of fact, yeah, as a matter of uh, fact, uh, one was probably saying, thank God he's back there. And the other one was probably saying, thank God he's up there. I'm not fortunate because of distance to spend a lot of time with my grandchildren. But this past week since I was in Birmingham and, and, and Nia uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. and brought the boys. We had dinner and yeah, and I went like, I'm so glad to see them. And, and 45 minutes later, like, y'all think we all wrap this up? Y'all think we all? <laughs> this, this, this young boy done crawled on my shoulders, stuck his finger in my ear, and put cornbread and syrup on my, on my suit. Oh, oh, it's been long enough. It's been long enough. <laughs> see y'all next year. It's been long enough. <laughs> it's, been, it's been, so you can see. No, I really do miss them in case Nia's watching this. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they were terrorists on me. They was like, yeah, yeah. And let me tell you this little part because I got to get it out. I need counseling like that. When I first walked, I first walked in, I, I said to Kadarius, I said, hey, I, he was so kind. I said, I'm going to give you $2. I'm going to give you $2. And we spent the whole meal, got terrorized. I survived. I'm getting ready to leave. It's been nice talking with y'all. Bless you. And Kadarius, Kadarius looked at me with his head halfway down and said, you all going to give me that $2, right? So one can understand how Jesus could get lost, and they did not find Jesus immediately. Of course, they had already traveled for a day. So it was going to take a day to get back. And I'm not sure if they looked in the parks around the water uh, where the animals hung out. I'm not sure where all they had looked, but the scripture says they found Jesus in the temple area. And here are the words recorded in Luke 2, 46, 47. After three days, they found him, Jesus, in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Yes, the next verse tells us in Luke 2 and 48, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. astonished. His, mother, his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this, your Father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Let me just throw this out. If that had been my mama, those would not have been the words expressed in the text. Nobody would have looked at Gussie Lee and said she looks astonished. My mama, who loved the Lord, but had a cuss word tucked in between, in betwixt, would have completely, now I can say it, don't you dare say that, would have completely unloaded 
But what is even more significant in the text is what Jesus says in 2, chapter 2, verse 49. He says to them, 12 years old, why were you searching for me? Maybe because you're 12. Why, why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Oh, when I read the response of Jesus, I had to quickly, I quickly, oh, just, I had to think about the television show. Uh, it's, it's, it, 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 yeah, if you're 30, you never heard of it. But, but television show that used to call uh, What's Happening? Yeah. Don't tell your age, don't tell your age. But, but two, two of the characters were Dee and Roger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And every time Dee thought Roger was in trouble, she would say, ooh, you going to get it. Oh, my goodness. When Jesus' parents said, where, when Jesus' parents asked him a question, and he says, why were you searching to me? I think of that encounter, and I said, ooh, Jesus, you going to get it. But there's a twofold statement here. One. Why were you searching for me? And two, did you not know I had to be in my father's house? Now, the second part of the scripture actually seems to soften the first part of the verse. As if to say, where else would I be? Jesus has already given evidence of the call on his life to something that is beyond himself and this is the call of each of us as we live every day as we live there's a constant pull that there's something beyond us all, all of us have been exposed to the world that is around us we have been exposed to food pos possessions actions attractions and many other things and as we look around we can easily see some of those things and we work hard for them but the reality is that there's something greater that's calling on each of us. And that greater thing is service. Jesus is positioning himself to be a service. Dr. King said everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Yes, indeed, all of us can serve, and we find Jesus placing himself in a position where he can serve. The phrase that says Jesus was listening and, and questioning them was actually a phrase used in that day, not so much that the person was participating, but the person was being available. The issue here is service. I would challenge you, I would challenge you to go around and ask people, if you made a New Year's resolution, what was it? Well, and see how many people said, I want to serve more. Right. However, the call of service is the primary interaction between God and humanity. That God does want to bless us with material things, with help, with peace, with, with, with joy and long suffering. But God also wants to bless us with hearts of service. Oh, help me somebody. Help me somebody. God wants to bless us not only that we will have what we have, but something's calling us beyond ourselves. That God is calling us to a place of service. Why do we celebrate the life of Dr. King in this season? Because Dr. King bought into what it means to serve. So let me tell you a few things about service as we see them unfold in this text. As we serve, we must recognize that comfort is not always our calling. <laughs> comfort. Comfort is not always our calling. Many times we overlook and, and don't see our gifts initially because we operate within the realm of if I'm called to serve, then it must be comfortable. It would appear that the comfort zone of Jesus would be hanging out with 12-year-olds. I'm not completely clear on how 12-year-old during the time of Jesus would spend his or her time, but I would imagine hanging out with religious leaders 
will probably not be high on the agenda. But when Jesus is hanging out with those in the temple beyond the comfort zone of 12, he's symbolizing for us what it means to serve, that sometimes we've got to serve in places in which we are not comfortable. And we can never buy being comfortable as to being a sign that we're in our place of service. Sometimes in our service, it will not be comfortable. Do you think it was comfortable for First Lady Michelle Obama to be First Lady of the United States? Some things are not always in our comfort zone and we have to live in such a way that when God calls us to places outside of our comfort zone, we say, God, if you're calling me here, I feel uncomfortable being in this spot, but if you're calling me to it, I'll do it. Comfort. It's not always a call. And I was working on this sermon this week and got a call from an email from a university and asking me to submit an article. And I said, I write sermons. Last academic paper I wrote was when I was in school and I retired from that. But the reason, reason when I searched my heart, the reason I was saying it is because I didn't feel comfortable. And I didn't want to be critiqued. But I had to open up to say, God, is this is an area you're calling me into. I'm going to be uncomfortable and still do it. So sometimes when you serve, come real closer. You're going to find yourself serving somebody who's going to get it on your last everlasting nerve. And you're going to go home, you're going to pray, you're going to fast, you're going to read your Bible, and you're going to come back to them, and they're going to tick you off just as much the second time as they did the first time. I got to rush on, I got to rush on, but when people tell me, Reverend, I don't work in that ministry because I ain't happy. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Who in the ham and eggs ever told you you were going to be happy? Sometimes when we serve beyond ourselves, we're not going to be happy and comfortable. Can I tell you what I discovered as I move on? I've discovered that just as much as the other person ticks me off, I tick them off. <laughs> mm. Comfort is not always our call. And here's the 12 year old hanging out with religious leaders. I think comfortable. But the second thing it tell you, tells us is that familiarity is not always our audience. Someone has so rightly said that familiarity does something for us. And some people will, st will get stuck in a bad situation and stay because it's familiar. Some people will stay in a job that they do not like rather than try for another job because the bad job is familiar. But there are moments when God takes us from our familiar spaces because the familiar space is not always our audience. Staying back as his family left was not familiar. Mom and dad, and that would be the familiar place. And sometimes God calls us to serve in places that's not familiar. And you will often say to yourself, everybody got to be somewhere. But why am I here? As I look back over my own life, I, I feel that sometimes my life has been serving in places that have not been familiar, have not been second nature, but they have all been places of calling. 
in Nashville and in Des Moines and here in Bridgeport. So before you condemn the place of your service, please know that we often are called to serve in places that are not familiar. Dr. King often found himself in places that were not familiar, but they were places of service. Having a bomb go off at your house ain't familiar. That doesn't happen every day, but he kept on serving. Having other preachers say that you should just wait and sit and listen is not a great place, but he understood being in places that are not familiar. If you want to serve, no, it's not going to always be comfortable. And it's not going to always feel familiar. You are not going to be just at home. That's why this final point, and that is our growth does not always go according to our schedule. Can I tell you something, and you, and you promise not to tell but one person at a time? If God would just check in with me, I will let God know the areas in which I'm ready to grow. Just check in. I'm going to give you the agenda. Here's where I want to grow. As my mother would say, ratch him. <laughs> but God often calls us to grow in areas in which we do not want to grow. Come here. That person, I, I like preaching this sister. Yeah. That person who's agitating you, that situation that's frustrating you, sometimes is God calling us to grow in that area. Because if I grow, what's agitated me, help me preach this, I won't agitate you anymore. If I grow, what's frustrating me won't frustrate me anymore. So sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes that which I'm complaining about and that which is frustrating me is a red light saying grow, 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 grow. Where's raise up? Priest always, I think I will. I think I think I will. You see, the one thing that service will cause us to do is to grow. The last verses in the text we read, Luke 2, 5, 51 and 52 says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. I promise you, let me just read the rest of it. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And the text says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Let me challenge this. Jesus, then he went down to the uh, to narrate with them and was obedient to them. That wasn't a nice walk. Now nah, you traveling together, but everybody ain't happy. I suggest you better be obedient to them. If not, we may be reading about the crucifixion that happened at 12. But his mother treasured all these things can I translate that for you? I would strangle you if I didn't remember what the angel told me. And here it is. Jesus grew. Why would the Son of God need to grow? Is it not to incarnate and everything that is not to grow? Well, this growth is an inward expression and an outward flow. The inward expression is that he went on back to Nazareth and was obedient to his parents. There are some situations in which we have to suffer for now so that the big picture can be realized. Oh, I'm doing this now, but I know the outcome will reap greater benefits. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and 
Man, I want you to hear me clearly because I alluded to this sometimes a few weeks ago that there are some things that, that, that only God can do. And there are some things that only we can do. And one of the things we can do is grow. And what God is calling us, as God is calling us into service, God says you're not going to be comfortable, it's not going to be familiar, but one thing you can recognize, you will be growing. Oh, I wish I had a witness this morning because somebody can testify it was not the sunshine that made you grow. It was not the peace that made you grow. It was not when everything flowed together that made you grow. But it's when you didn't have that money for that bill. It's when that relationship was at odds. It's when you didn't know what God was doing that you found yourself growing in the process. So what God says, help me, Holy Ghost, that the first thing I want you to recognize when you come to the ministry of Jesus, that Jesus in introduces us to a life of service. Woo, so when I get on my knees to pray, I'm not just asking God for the new car. I, I do that too. I'm not just asking God for the new home. I do that too. I'm not just asking God for the money in my pocket, but I, I will do that too. But when I'm asking God, God let me grow. That everything doesn't give me doubt. God help me to grow. That every bad news doesn't push me over the edge. God help me to grow. That I'm not cussing about, I cussing out everybody I talk to. God help me to grow. That I can focus on my life and stay out of other folks' business. God help me to grow. Yeah. Woo! Help me to grow. In every situation. God help me to grow. Because if I'm to serve. I got to, I got to grow. I got to grow up. Michael Beckwith, who's a pastor, spiritual leader, says every day we need to be asking ourselves, what can I learn? How can I serve? How can I grow? Not God, don't you see what I'm going through? God, won't you fix? But what can I learn? How can I grow? And how can I serve? If you've ever been at a funeral in the South, you probably have heard someone sing this song at the funeral. May the works I've done speak for me. When I'm resting, in my grave and nothing else can be said may the works I've done speak for me may the service I give speak for me God thank you the king lived thank you the Rosa Parks lived Thank you to all those people who have transformed the world. Live. But God, don't, me, don't let me live every day and not make the same impact. God, let me serve in such a way that my service will make an impact and help change the world. Rather than complain about it, I'm going to serve my way through it. Hey, I'm going to serve my way through it. And the service beyond self. Here's how Jesus said it, and I really am done. Jesus gave us a quote. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things, y'all know the verse, add unto you. Jesus says, in essence, from the verse, don't just serve for your own benefit. But serve others. And as you serve others, watch me take care of you. As you serve others, watch me. <laughs> Let us stand together.
says, as you serve others, trust me to work it out. Even if you don't see me, trust me to work it out. God, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. God, help us to serve. Serve in ministry, to serve others. Help us to serve. Because God, we can get ticked pretty fast. But help us to grow in such a moment to know whatever situations and people bother us. <laughs> You've been dealing with them a long time. <laughs> help us to grow and help us to serve. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you for sharing the Word of God with us today. I pray that you would consider becoming a supporter to help us as we spread the message of God and the Word of God in the ministry of the East End Church. If so, there are several ways you can be a financial blessing. Givelify. Simply go to the Givelify app and locate the East End Baptist Tabernacle Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Also, you can use Cash App. With Cash App, it is not the name, but just the letters spelled out with cash sign E-E-B-T-C. Also, you can always use the mail, 548 Central Avenue, Bridgeport, Connecticut, 06607. But I pray that you would consider uh, becoming a, a donor and being able to support as we continue to move the kingdom of God ahead. God bless you and have a great day.